This whole series, we've been talking about the idea of how do you take a people group that for four generations at least, over 400 years have been in slavery. At first it started out okay and it got really bad towards the end. How do you take a people that thought God had abandoned them rescue them, pull them out, put them in the desert and say, you're God's chosen people. God knew who they were, but they really struggled to believe it. And we watched this dynamic of them trying to discover God, and that's the whole point of the series, to discover that God is not just out there, but he's with them. How do you take Moses, who by all assessments, was just kind of living separate from his Hebrew heritage, not knowing God until this burning bush shows up. How do you take this guy and he becomes the one to lead 1.5 million people out of Egypt and into the promised land? How do you do that? This whole series, and we only got this part, and next week, the whole thing wraps right? But how do you learn that you are God's chosen people? So what we've been trying to do is make it real practical, yeah? So easy to look at the Old Testament stories and say, man, those guys are a bunch of idiots, right? Like, look what they're doing. Like, they, they just had a miracle, and then they did something ridiculous. And are they really that different from us? Isn't humanity always kind of been the same? I mean, we all got fears and concerns and hang-ups, and we have joys and sorrows. Like, we've always been just people. So what we've been trying to do is say, listen, as they've been discovering who God is for them, are we discovering who God is for us? Now, we are on this side of the cross. We got a whole new reality they never even experienced. But I do think it's powerful to go back and look at what they went through and see if it matters to us. I'm going to be sharing some of the most famous stories in the entire Old Testament. But if we leave here with more information or merely more intelligent, we have failed. All revelation and information you are to receive is to connect you with the one that you love the most. Everything you learn needs to be put through the filter of God. What should I do with this? How am I supposed to process this? What can I do to love you more? The idea to give you information is to make you bond with God. That's it. I want everybody walking out of here going, man, I feel like I know God a little bit more. I feel like he's a little bit more in my life. If you have not yet made a decision in your heart to be with Jesus Christ, I gotta tell you, I don't know how you can read the word of God, I don't know how you can live life without him. I don't know how you can say, I'm okay, without knowing that you've been rescued. So once again, this is a beautiful day to do that. So I'm gonna begin and try to make a lot of this very, very personal as we walk through these stories. I don't care how many thousands of years ago it was, it almost feels like we've been walking through the same TV show today. Amen? Amen. Let's begin with what happened last week. Last week, Pastor Matt brilliantly laid out for us the design of what's called the tabernacle. We know it, and it's referred to in the story as the tent of meeting. It was really the place that Moses met with God. He explained how all the furniture and the schematics of it was designed for one thing, get closer to God, get closer to God, get closer to God. It's gonna be referred to in our message, but once again, if you missed any of that message, you can get it, it's all free online. You can go back and listen to it. I got a chance to listen to it on the way up to an elder retreat. I got a chance to listen to Pastor Judah's prior message. Once again, you were well taken care of. But as we begin our time today, I wanna to get real personal real fast. Here's the question for you. Who or what has your heart? Who or what has your heart? The Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So periodically in life, we must consistently ask the question, where am I spending my money? Where am I spending my time? Those will reveal what is important to you. And you go, now hold on, pastor, I've heard this before. Before you go on any further, let me tell you this. Man, these days, 
all my money is spent on my mortgage or rent, and every last bit of my money is going in my tank, right? I mean, gas has been so brutal, right? I I haven't been exactly doing anything fun with my money, so I appreciate you asking that question. I'm not quite sure what it's going to reveal. All right, let me ask you this. So you're telling me that what you pay for mortgage or rent is so high because you are unwilling to live with multi-generations. Is that what you're telling me? You're telling me that you're not willing to live with parents and grandparents all in the same house for the whole time. Are you telling me that you are not willing to have five roommates? Are you telling me that independence is so important to you that you're spending the vast majority of your money to live alone? Is that what you're telling me? See, all I'm saying is that we're very quick to be able to say, I'm not doing anything important with my money. Everything you're spending on it talks about value. Let's talk about gas. Where are you going? Go to work, right? I'm just going to work. Why do you live so far from where you work? Because you want to be in the suburbs. You want to make sure that you get it, right? Everything you are doing has a value system that's attached to it. I'm just asking you, why is that important to you? And as you examine around who or what has your heart, probably a better biblical way to say it is what are you worshiping, right? What are you worshiping? Worship means that we find value in something and then we in turn pour value into it. It means we think it's important. The fastest way to get to what you worship is where does your mind tend to go? Where does your mind drift? Where does your mind camp? Where does your mind dwell? In other words, if you're constantly thinking about this, that's valuable to you. And that may be what you worship. But the challenge is, it's been said wisely, we become what we worship. So what are you becoming? Right? If you become what you worship, anytime we are worshiping the wrong thing, we will distort our created intent. You were built for a purpose. You were built for God. If at any point something has taken his place in the center of your life, it's going to throw you off. You're not going to feel right. You're not going to feel centered. You're not going to feel grounded. Why? Because you were built with such a beautiful design, but it is all meant to fire off the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Any time we have had something else take our heart away, you start feeling an agitation. You start feeling a loss. You start feeling a lack of purpose. And things begin to break apart. Fill in the blank on the sheet in front of you is this. Until we commit, our worship goes to the highest bidder. Until we commit, our worship, what takes our mind away, will go to the highest bidder. If we have multiple power forces pulling us in different directions, who's going to win? And have we not begun to live in a world that has dialed in the ability to get our attention? Right? You open up in the morning, what's one of the first things you do? You probably grab your phone. You grab your phone, you throw open your news app or whatever it is, you scroll through whatever you do, and there's a million emergencies that you must be focused on. It's all over the world. It's a new movement you have to be a part of. There's a terrible thing happening that you need to worry about. And there's a million things designed in such a way as to grab you by the throat and pull you into their world. There's so many power forces, but what will be the final determiner of who we are And what we do, unless there is a firm determination of commitment made, we will be directed by whatever seems most important at the time. Listen to this. Commitment keeps us safe when our minds are spun. Commitment keeps us safe when our minds are spun. Until there's a time when we say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, he's my rock, he's my everything, then something else can pull you away. But if you get a chance to match everything up and say, listen, that is important, but it's not my number one call. 
So I'm allowed to contribute towards it. I'm allowed to look at it. I'm allowed to engage with it, but it cannot own me. Only Jesus owns me. That's the lockdown commitment to worship only one and everything else needs to take its proper spot. Amen? Amen. All right, would you turn with me to Exodus 32, verse 1. Exodus 32, verse 1. If you are brand new to us and maybe have come in the last two months, real quick thing about me, I yell randomly. I just need to make you aware, all right? Because you're going to go, does he have a medical condition? And the answer is no, it's just my personality. So uh, if you're like, you're really disturbing my sleep, I apologize in advance, all right? That's what earplugs are for. Here we go, Exodus 32, 1. When the people saw that Moses, that's their big dog leader, delayed to come down from Mount Sinai, he's been up there for 40 days, over a month, the people down below gathered themselves together to Aaron, that's Moses' brother who's supposed to be in charge, and they said to him, get up, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses guy, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. In other words, he's probably burned up on that big fiery mountain he's been hanging out on, and he ain't coming home. We're moving on. Verse two, so Aaron said to them, okay, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Okay, pause, anybody got a problem with this story yet? (laughs) What the heck? When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it to worship it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow will be a feast to Yahweh. I'm sorry, what? (laughs) I thought we were doing the cow thing. What, what do you, uh, all right? And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Real quick side note, and I'll keep this PG. Jews are super cagey and uncomfortable talking about sex. In the Bible, they always use euphemisms. Rose up to play is that. This is orgiastic. Let's pause. What the heck is going on? I mean, what really just happened here? This is craziness. You have them making a cow. Why is it a cow? And they're worshiping in it and saying, these are the new gods, plural, that are going to lead us forward because Yahweh, who just got us out of Egypt, Apparently, we're done with him, and we're going to move on. But Aaron makes everything even more complicated, and he's like, yeah, Yahweh. And you're like, dude, I, don't, I can't even follow you right now. It's like this merger of paganism and yet not leaving Yahweh behind, so it's kind of a God combo. What a mess. There's one reason why Aaron did this because he was a people pleaser and he was trying to make everybody happy and he couldn't stand for what's right. I mean, you gotta remember, you're the number two guy, yeah? I mean, Moses has always been the like hardcore one and then you were the guy behind him going, yeah. (laughs) Right, and and then all of a sudden he's gone and you're like, oh shoot, like it's all on me now, that's just uncomfortable. Well, Aaron can't, can't stand up for what's right and the people, are very aggressive and they're like, Moses is dead, you gotta move on, you're our real leader and I always liked you better anyway, right? And you gotta do something about that, you gotta give us new gods. Well he totally caves, now he knows. He was in Pharaoh's throne room when these plagues were raining down. There is no way he's gonna fully turn his back on God so he's gotta compromise. That's dangerous, is it not? Anybody starting to feel a little bit of this coming into their personal life? We'll get there. 
okay? So he does this, we're into God, but we also are into other stuff. So you're good, you're good, you're good, right? And he allows God's name to be drugged through the mud. Brutal. Okay, let's make it personal. How many times have we wimped out when it comes to doing something for God? How many times have we cared more about what people say than what God will say? How many times have we been too insecure to stand up for what is right? So let's be real careful on judging Aaron. You telling me every time God tapped you on the shoulder, you went all in. I don't think so. I think we would operate very differently if that was the case. It is human nature to cave, but at what point are we going to have commitment and say, God is my number one, everything else has to be number two? At what point do we lock in and we say, God, you have my everything. I'm more concerned about you than anybody else. Commitment helps us hang in there when our minds are spun. Aaron's mind got spun and he went ballistic. And God was dishonored. Every time we compromise like that, we erode our relationship with God and it ultimately steals our joy and our glory. Okay, so we know what happened, but why did it happen? This is the bigger question for me. Because listen to this. Israel had already, we're only two months into the journey. Israel had already verbally committed themselves to God. They promised to be obedient. They saw the Red Sea part. They saw the bitter waters made sweet. They saw water come out of a rock. They ate heavenly manna, and that was all in the first month. They're only on month two. They already knew the Ten Commandments, and they knew the second one said, don't make a statue. Okay, let's pause for a moment. If you only have 10 rules, let's say you fall asleep and drift at number six. It was number two. You were still awake during that time. Don't have any other gods before me. Don't make any statues or images. They automatically, we gotta make a cow. What? It was number two on the list. They already knew that. They even saw Moses go up on the mountain talk to God, and come back at least once. So it's not like he hasn't done this before, right? And the elders with Moses had already met with God, already seen glimpses of his glory, already seen partial of his throne room. They were told to wait for Moses and Joshua to get back. Aaron's in charge. Everything was clear cut. So what in the world happened? This is not like we're 30 years into the wandering in the desert. We just got rolling. And they had seen so many miracles. How did this happen? Well, here's the bottom line. They did not have any true relationship that would sustain their disappointment. There was no real relationship. I know it's so easy to say, well, they're Hebrews. Yeah, but they don't remember they're Hebrews. God knows they're chosen. They don't know they're chosen. God knows they're precious. They don't know they're precious. And when their identity isn't locked in, when they do not see God in the true way he is, it was never gonna last. There's no relational foundation. And you go, well, why not? Okay, well, let's walk through it. God started with fear. You guys remember how this worked? I mean, they were there when there was like firstborn of Egypt dying, there was boils, there was livestock, crazy plagues. Then they get out, they get at the foot of the mountain, God comes down, and there is thunder and lightning and smoke and darkness over this mountain. God starts talking to them, and they are so scared, they're like, I think I peed a little. (laughs) Moses is terrified, and they're like, make him stop talking. Make him go away. He can talk to Moses, and Moses can talk to us, and I can't handle this. Why would God begin with with fear. 
Because when you deal with a pagan people, sometimes the first step is to instill the fear of God so they'll take you seriously. The problem is, is fear is not a lasting motivator. It's only step one. And it needs to go to love in step two, or it will never work. We're still new. God only went through step one. He hasn't even got to step two, and the people bail. But this is why we need to understand that this actually applies to us. Fear will never keep someone's heart. As a matter of fact, sometimes fear will motivate them to make a decision, but then it creates emotional distance. All right, now let's get personal. Some of y'all got saved in a fire and brimstone church. The pastor came to you and said, you do realize you're going to hell, yes? You were like, uh, I do now. <laughs> He's like, hell's really bad. You said, I've heard. He said, if you do not have Jesus' fire insurance, you will die for eternity. Do you know how long eternity is? Well, it sounds really long. It is. And it's worse than you think. Well, what do I do? Well, you get saved. Well, I'm in. Let's go. Okay, that is a motivator for the moment. But fear is only a motivator as long as you're afraid. The minute it's out of sight, out of mind, you go back to selfishness. Some of you never moved off phase one. You go to church because you're afraid of what happens if you don't. You go to church and you give tithe because you're trying to honor the big guy. You're trying to appease the one you're slightly afraid of. You never transitioned into love, relationship, and personal. You are still operating in a place where God is the man upstairs, that God is the one who's a hammer waiting to fall, that he is simply judge, and you have emotionally distanced. Every time people say things like, oh, I love Jesus, you're like, yeah, I don't even understand what you're talking about. I respect him. It's about as far as I go. That is not sufficient. So how in the world is God going to get these people from fear to love? How's he going to build Moses into a leader that can lead them from fear to love? That's what we're trying to examine. Ah. One thing that's interesting to me, is I don't think everybody was in on the rebellion and let's do the cow thing. I think it was a crew, right? But it does remind me of this. Sometimes in church, we want good things. We want our church to thrive. We want the presence of God. We want miracles. We want transform marriages and transform lives but we rely on the leadership to get it done. That is never gonna happen. As long as we as a church say, hey, the Bible says prayer is really important. We should get a prayer team. Oh, there's 10 of them, we're good. Do you really believe that 10 people are going to pray in everything into your life? Don't you believe that not until the body begins to pray, not until the believers of the family begin to see the value will there be holistic transformation. We cannot rely on leadership, they can't cut it, they can't do it. You cannot say we need a revival and you leave it all to six people. That's not gonna happen. At some point, we gotta buy in that we're a family and that we do it all together. The whole nation's gonna get busted for this golden calf thing. God gets so ticked off, he throws a plague in on them. You're gonna find out 3,000 people are gonna get slaughtered. The whole crew ends up getting in trouble for this thing. Why? Because the majority of them were in on it. Can't we do that on the flip side? Can't we have a bunch of us get fired up for the Lord, begin to pray for his thick presence, begin to pray for his power to move in our midst, begin to pray for our marriages, then we'll see movement, amen? amen. We cannot leave it to leadership. There's simply not enough of them, right? All right. 
when this went down, there was one crew that hung in there, specifically. It was interesting because Moses is looking around, and we're gonna find out who this crew is in a moment, and you end up finding out there's a whole team that stuck with him. Why were they able to stay? Because commitment pulls you through when your heart gives up, right? Paul has this analogy, Paul the Apostle, in Ephesians chapter six, he uses an analogy about the Christian life called the armor of God, super famous. When he gets to the subject of faith, he says it's like a shield, a Roman shield, that the enemy is firing at you like crazy lies. And instead of letting them all sink into your head and distort your mind, what you're supposed to do is hide behind what you know to be true in the word of God and wait for the volley of arrows to stop. That's faith. Sometimes we just need to say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and hide until the arrows are all gone. Because we're committed to who God says he is. We're committed to who God has revealed himself to be, and we do not allow circumstances to dictate our theology. We hide behind faith. All right. Well, sure enough, God gets super ticked at this whole thing. Moses is still up on the mountain when God reveals it to him. He's like, hey, your people are messed up, right? This is totally like parents going, your son, right? And you're like, uh, I think it's both of ours, quite frankly. And God says to Moses, your people have completely screwed up. And God goes, I'm gonna kill them all and start over with you. Now, that sounds awfully harsh. This was a big deal. They had given credit and glory to other gods. They had done the very thing that God told them not to do. They violated the covenant. It was a big deal. So God says to Moses, I'll just kill everybody and we'll start with your lineage. And Moses goes, no, you can't do that. And God goes, why not? And he goes, well, two reasons. Number one, it's gonna make you look bad. And here's what he meant. Egypt just got decimated by you and they watch your people come out and what, you kill them all in the desert? You look like a really angry God. It's just gonna make you look bad. Secondly, God, I know you. You're a promise keeper. And you didn't just promise the Levi lineage that's my family. You actually promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. That means all 12 tribes were supposed to be the promised people. You can't kill them all and just let one lineage survive. That's not what you promised. It's one of the only times in the Bible this happens. It says, and God repented. How weird is that? The word repent means change your mind. God changed his mind. Now, did he really? No. Now, here's why. <laughs> God is playing Moses beautifully. God is trying to make this man who will end up being so frustrated with these people. He's just gonna go ballistic on them in just a second. There's gonna be problem. There's already been resistance after resistance after resistance. They're already all up on his nerves. God is fusing him into a shepherd. So he goes, I'm gonna kill them all. And Moses goes, you can't do that. And he's like, why not? Well, because you can't, because like you're a good God and, and the whole time you know God is smiling, looking over at his angels and then he looks back at Moses, real serious. <laughs> do you guys know how we do this as parents, right? You're trying to correct your little one and then you look over at your spouse and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm trying not to laugh. I'm trying not to laugh. And you put your mom face on, right? Okay, because the whole time, God is like, I can't kill them all? And he's like, no. He's like, why not? And he just keeps pushing him. Because you, you just can't. Oh, okay, I'll change my mind. Good job, buddy. Now you're sounding like a shepherd. Now you're sounding like a defender. Now you're sounding like the one that I need. Okay. And so God changes his mode. Now something I do need you to understand is that there are some of us that are not having a rich prayer life. You're simply not praying because you believe in your emotional heart that God's gonna do what he's gonna do anyway. You blew the system. 
God designed a system where he triggers his movements on the prayers of his people. Why? I don't know. He did it that way, and it connects him and us. He can always do stuff without us. He doesn't want to. So you're not praying, and there are miracles not happening because he's not triggering anything. Oh, he's going to do what he's going to do. Not till you do it. Why? Because he's saying, listen, I want to do it with you. I told you prayer matters. Intercession matters. But you keep going, well, I don't know. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. No, it's not. Get involved. That's what the Bible says. Well, it shouldn't really work that. I don't care how it should work. It's how it works, right? So next time your friend is hurting, I want you to become an intercessor. And you start praying into that and saying, God, in accordance with your will, because you know what is best. God, would you bring about change in that environment? Automatically, God smiles and goes, waiting for you. Let's go. Boom, drops in power. We pray because God tells us to pray. You're not violating him. You're not changing his mind. You're confirming what he put in your heart in the first place. Why do you think you wanted to pray that prayer anyway? You think you just thought of that? He gave it to you and said, go, pull the trigger. Pull the trigger. I'm ready to go, right? Well, sure enough, Moses intercedes for everybody. And then now that God is relatively cool, he's not great, but now that he's relatively cool, Moses gets mad. Now it's Moses' turn. He comes down the mountain and he sees Joshua, who never gets anything fun. He doesn't get to hang out at the party. He doesn't get to see God. He just hangs out in the middle. He's like, Joshua. And Joshua's like, Moses, I'm so glad you're here. Dude, I think there's war in the camp. And he's like, that's not a war, my friend. That's a party. He's like, What? They come down around the corner. Moses is carrying the Ten Commandments of God written by the hand of God. They come around the corner. He sees the orgiastic stuff going on. And Moses, now that he, it's not theoretical, now it's right in front of him, loses it. And he goes ballistic. I can't, you have decimated the laws of God. And he grabs his tablets, smashes them on the ground, and just starts lighting up on everybody. Now, real quick, as a Bible nerd, this super freaks me out. Here's why. God hand wrote those. I literally desperately want to know what font he chose. Imagine if it was Comic Sans. <laughs> it's a cheesy old font, yeah. <laughs> but can you imagine something written by the hand of God we could have had? Moses, dude, your anger is causing problems. Like, I get it. You're being dramatic and you're trying to tell the people something. You broke tablets God wrote on. Man, that would have been so cool. By the way, we don't even have the duplicates that they ended up making later on, right? So I guess it doesn't matter. But I just think that would have been so powerful, right? That we actually had something God wrote on. All right. Well, sure enough, Moses goes after Aaron. Dude, I left you in charge. What is wrong with you? Aaron, who has no backbone, right? He has no idea what he's going to say. So he starts going, the people, right? Like, you get mad at the people. Like, you know how they are, right? And they're all up in my face. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And I'm freaking out. He starts blaming everybody else. Then he just panics. Honestly, dude, I like, they gave me all this gold. And I was like, ah, and I threw it in the fire. Wow, popped a cow. Did you just argue out popped a cow? That's not even a thing, dude. That's not even a miracle thing. Nobody does that. Nobody puts gold in a fire and a cow comes out. You're just making stuff up. But Aaron doesn't know what to do. Well, then Moses lights into the people. And he said, are all of you wicked? And all of a sudden he hears a voice. No, sir. He's like, who's that? Levites, hoo right? They all show up. You're like, whoa, where did you guys come from? Right? And that's his crew. They're Levites. They all stand around. And he's like, you guys got swords? They're like, of course we have swords. We always have swords. Go out and slaughter all the people that did this. They go out and kill 3,000 people by their hand. These are their brothers and sisters. And God nods at the Levites. Those are my people. You will be closer to me. 
I see it. Side note, there are 12 tribes of Israel, yes? They originally came from 12 guys. Those are their names. One guy's name was Levi. Well, he was kind of buddies with another one of his siblings named Simeon. And they were kind of known as a little terror couple where they were partners in crime. They were known for one thing specifically. You guys know what it was? Violence. How fascinating is it that God chose the violent group to be his priests and his Levites? You would go, huh, I'd see those as two opposite things. No. What God said was, I put a passion for justice in you, but I need you to channel it this way, not this way. It can make you a monster or it can make you a worshiper. And he redirected all of their passion straight down into God. Y'all, I don't know where you came from, but a lot of you think God can't use where you come from. I think that when it's rechanneled, it's going to be glorious. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pick it up uh, in verse uh, 7. So Moses ends up interceding for everybody, and God's like, okay, well, what do you want? Moses is like, well, if you're going to blot them out, blot me out too. God's like, dang, that's hardcore. I'm not doing that, but I appreciate it. Uh, I will bring a plague on them. I will have ramifications for them, but I get it. Okay, cool. Let's go back to the plan. We're going to move them to the promised land, but I'm not going with you. Moses is like, what? He's like, no, no, no. I'll send my angel with you, but I, I'm not going to go. If I go with you, I'm just going to want to kill everybody all the time. And Moses goes, if you don't go, I don't want to go. And that's where we pick it up in verse 7, where, in 33, 7. Now, Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. This is what Pastor Matt told us about last week. Everyone who sought the Lord would go to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. But whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each one would stand at the tent door and watch Moses until he had gone in. When Moses went into the tent, the pillar of the cloud of God's presence would descend and stand at the entrance to the tent, and Yahweh would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus, Yahweh used to speak with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses would go back to his camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not leave. We talked about what it means, but I want to talk to you about something brilliant. God is trying to make a people of his own. He's trying to make a leader that would lead those people. So where does he begin? With intimacy and communication and depth. So he goes into the tent of meeting and it says he would talk with Moses like a friend. You know what's interesting about that is that friends don't just talk about business. They talk about whatever's on their heart. May your spiritual life get to the place where your prayer time is not simply a laundry list, but just pouring your heart out to God. You guys, my greatest dream would be for God to say, Lance, man, I talk to him like a friend. We know each other. He dumps stuff out on me, and he says stuff that's not funny. And... But we hang out. We're together. Because it's in that intimacy time, that personal relationship with God, that things begin to transform. Once again, we cannot allow God to be distant. We must pursue until God is near. Amen? Amen. All right. But Moses cries out. He says, I don't want to go if you're not going to be here with us. My, I can't cut it. I don't have the right strength. I can't lead these people. God, if you're not there, I don't want to be a part of it. What a beautiful desperation. God, I know you said you're going to send some of you. Which, by the way, he said he's going to send the angel of the Lord. In my opinion, that is Jesus before the, major, before the manger. And that's pretty, that's pretty sweet. But what God was saying is, I'm going to send some of me, not all of me. And Moses said, I want all. 
I'm not content with some. You guys, do you know that that's what I pray to be the hunger of the heart of Bridgeway? I don't want some. You guys, we have some. We have miracles that occur in this church. I just talked last night about a man healed of cancer. We have miracles. I just talked with a man last night who just got saved and healed and delivered. We have miracles. We have some. I'm not okay with that. I want all. I want everything that is legit that God has for us. I want every miracle. I want every power. I want every connection piece. I want every marriage healed that can be healed. I want every life to be saved that can be saved. I want all of it. And I will not stop leading this church until we have everything that God says we can have. Amen? Amen. I want us to be passionate so that each and every heart of us says, I want more of God in my life. I understand I have a prayer life. I want to go deeper. I understand that I'm being used by God in the supernatural. I want more. I understand that God says he loves me. I want to know how much. And you're going to watch. Moses had a lot, but he kept pressing in and pressing in and pressing in for more. That's what I want for every one of us. That's a church worth attending. 33, 17, and the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have asked of me I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, then please show me your glory, meaning I want more. He said, all right, I'll make my goodness pass before you. I'll proclaim before you my name, Yahweh, and I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll show mercy on whom I will show mercy, but kiddo, you cannot see all of me in my face and live. What was his point? Human beings can't handle it. Until you're glorified, you can't handle me. So I'll give you as much of me as I can because I wanna be next to you, but I also can't blow your head off, right? That would kind of defeat the purpose. So here's our plan. I need you to go up on the mountain with me and there's gonna be a little area where there's a niche in the rock wall, right? Like a little cleft. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have you hide in there and I, as I come around the corner, I'm gonna put my hand over you. My hand's super big, right? So I'm gonna put my hand over you and you can't really see. And then I'm gonna walk by you and I'm gonna tell you what I'm like, right? Because that will help transform your heart. But as I pass by, I'm gonna take my hand off and you can see my backside. Because you can't really see me from the front, okay? Moses said, okay, it's all excited. So they have a date. Verse five, 34, five. Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. The Lord passed before him and said, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head to the earth and worshiped. That's how you grow. God, I want more. I'll give you all I can, kiddo. I'm doing the devotion for this Wednesday. If you guys have signed up to do the devotions, the Exodus devotions, and listen to them, mine's on this passage. So I'm not gonna recap that. I just wanna give one point. This is one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible, and here's why. I live in a religious context. I'm around religious stuff all the time, predominantly mainstream Christianity. And everybody has an opinion of what God is like. Everybody tells me what they think God is like. Here's the problem, I don't trust any of them. (laughs) But this one time, God didn't go through a mediator. This one time, God said, I don't care what anybody else thinks about me, I'm gonna tell you exactly who I am. And no matter what happens, you lock in on this because I'm telling you personally. I don't care if your life goes sideways. I don't care if you get confused. I don't care if other people are telling you something different. I just told you personally what I'm like. I want you to take it to the bank, lock it in, and never move off that. When you hide under your shield, this is what you're gonna take with you. This is me talking about me. 
That is so refreshing to my spirit. I don't have to put a filter on. I don't have to try to analyze it. I don't have to, now it's God telling me what he's like. So what did he just say? He just gave Moses seven truths about who he is. Number one, I am who I am. What does that mean? It means I'm not like anybody else you know. I'm not kind of like your dad. I'm not kind of like your mom. I'm not kind of like your friend. Quite frankly, you've never even imagined anything like me. So if you're gonna learn about me, you're learning about me fresh, all right? Don't try to compare me. I'm different. Number two, I am merciful and gracious. What that means is I'm always rescuing you from you. Number three, I am so patient. You guys, I'm not a hammer waiting to fall. I'm a dad waiting to hug. Come on. That's who I am. I forgive and I forgive and I forgive. I'm so patient. Number four, I'm overflowing with love. When you guys give up on people because your love is contingent, right? When you hold back because you're scared, I don't do that. I have spilling love that I'm willing to give you. And every time you come to me and you have your head down, you go, God, I'm not worthy of your love, I got a whole bunch for you, because that's who I am. Number five, I'm faithful. I don't give up, I don't bail out, I don't stop because it no longer works for me, I'm not flaky. I am consistent, strong, sure, and you can always count on me. I always keep my promises, I always do what I say I wouldn't do, and when everyone else bails on you, guess who's still there? Me, because I don't go anywhere. Number six, I'm forgiving. I don't have to forgive. Justice says I should kill you all. But guess what, you're still here, why? Because I am gonna consistently find a way for you and me to be together. And I'm gonna do it on your good days and on your bad days. But let's be clear, number seven, I am just. I don't just let things go. Bad guys don't just get away with stuff. Listen, I hold people accountable. Someone will pay for that sin. It will either be my Jesus or it will be the bad guy. Let's be real clear on that. So this whole business about God plays favoritism and I can do whatever I want, that's not a game I'm willing to play with you. But I love you. I love you more than you'll ever know. And everybody else has an opinion on me. This is who I am. And when you're struggling with cancer and you say I abandon you, this is true. I'm always this, no matter what's going on. So he reestablishes a covenant with Israel and hey guys, let's try again. And Moses goes up on the mountain and gets all these new explanations, but this time when he comes down, something's different. Last passage, Exodus 34, 29. Turn with her with me. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two new tablets of testimony in his hand, he came down from the mountain, but he didn't know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone. And they were afraid to come near him. They're like, dude, you are freaky. But Moses called him back, and Aaron and the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. <coughs> That's weird. Shiny skin guy. Eventually it faded, but for a while it was super creepy. Why? Do you remember the story in the New Testament where Jesus was transfigured? It means he went up on a mountain with his three best buddies and he started to glow and shine. You guys remember that? It says it was whiter than anything on earth and he just began to glow with his glory. And all of a sudden a cloud came and Elijah and Moses were there. It was this crazy situation. What was that about? You were finally seeing the glory of heaven. You're seeing what God really looks like. When Moses was hanging out with God, in that presence, in that intimacy, in that depth, it started to imprint on him. And he comes down, he didn't have a mirror, he has no idea. And they're like, what is wrong with you? He's like, what are you talking about? They're like, look at your face. He's like, I can't. <laughs> Let me ask you this final question as we close. Is there any evidence you've been with Jesus? 
I'm not saying you're going to glow like physically. That would be cool. Is there any evidence in your demeanor? Evidence in your joy level? Evidence in your actions? Evidence in how things are going? Are people going, dude, there's something different about you? Because you know what that is? God's imprinting on you. You've been spending such quality time with him, he's starting to leak, and you're starting to get it on you. You guys, I want to shine just like Jesus. Do you want that? That's what we're going to pray about. Let's close out. Heavenly Father, we want all of you. You've given us so much. You gave us your Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit, you're within us. You're dwelling in our midst. We just want more. Jesus, you sacrificed and gave us everything you had. It feels weird, but we want more of you. We want more of your presence, more of your power. We want all your people to experience it. And right now, Lord, there's some of us that have not yet quite clicked in. I pray that you would cultivate the soil of our heart that when we communicate with you, you begin to imprint on us. Lord, we want to be the believers that walk throughout this world shining like you. Our coworkers say something's different. Our spouses say something is different. God, would you emanate and let us pick it up? Would you increase our intimacy, our prayer times, our depth with you? Whatever you're willing to give us, show us your glory, both personally and as a group. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.